As far as smartphone enthusiasts are concerned, there's one brand that has filled the void that has been left behind by OnePlus and that is Aiku. Aiku's phones generally have top tier performance, very good cameras and of course they have an overall balanced experience as well with good uh, you know, battery life and great fast charging as well. And Aiku's first launch of 2023 is the Aiku 11. Just take a look at the specs. You get Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, you get LPDDR5 X RAM with UFS 4.0 storage, you get a 144Hz refresh rate display with LTPO 4.0 technology, you get 5000 mAh battery, 120 watt fast charging and you also get a Samsung GN5 you know, camera with V2 chip. And I'm barely just scratching the surface out here in terms of specs that are available on the iQ11. Now I've been using the iQ11 as my primary driver for the past 10 days on both an Airtel and Geo SIM with 5G on. And this is my detailed, very detailed in-depth review of the phone. And spoiler alert, it's a great start for 2023 for iQ. My name is Ashad. you're watching Track & Tech English. Let's begin. For this review, I want to switch it up a little bit with my general flow. I want to start with the performance first because it's very, very good on the iQ11. It's actually so good that it makes dedicated gaming phones seem pointless today. With that Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, 16 GB of LPDDR5 X RAM and 512 GB of UFS 4.0 storage, I got some of the best benchmark scores out there. Firstly, the storage read write speeds are crazy good. They're double of what we could achieve with UFS 3.1. Secondly, the Anti2 score was above 1.26 million and in Geekbench's multi-core score, we got 4671 points. This is slightly lower than the Vivo X90 Pro Plus that we tested recently. If you haven't watched the video, you should go check it out. But it is definitely better than every single flagship phone that launched last year, Android flagship phone. While these are synthetic benchmark numbers, I was more interested in the 3 Mark Wildlife stress test score because you can see how you know the phone performs under constant load. Now, what I noticed with the monster mode on the iQ and boost mode on Vivo is that you get a better stability scores on Vivo, that's for sure. But, and this is a big but, Vivo lost a lot of battery battery life and also got way hotter. The fact that in iQ11, the temperature rose to only 40 degrees as opposed to 57 degrees in the Vivo X90 Pro Plus is a huge win for me. Essentially what iQ wants to do is run the phone cooler and that's also because it's got a huge vapor cooling chamber as well. And that takes a little bit of hit in stability, but I'm completely okay with that because the performance is really, really good. I also ran the 3D Mark Wildlife stress test in balanced mode on the iQ11. And this is why I love this test because the stability score immediately jumped to a respectable 80.2%. But of course, the best loop score was lower and the highest frame rates were also reduced. And that is a clear indication of the difference between a dedicated monster performance mode and a balanced mode. To top off the great performance is of course, gaming is a lot of fun on the iQ11. Firstly, all games run at max graphics. On COD, you can play at 120 FPS and on Apex Legends, it can do extreme HD and ultra. And my favorite game, Apex Legends supports, uh, you know, game frame interpolation to 90 FPS using that V2 built-in chip that you get with the iQ11. I could actually sense that difference in performance because there's no other way to test it. And it was very similar to what I experienced with the iQ7 back in the day. Also, Genshin Impact can be frame interpolated to 144 frames per second and match that 144Hz refresh rate, which is fantastic. On top of that, you get a very detailed ultra game mode on the iQ11. If you are somebody who plays with the gyroscope, you can expect better sensitivity settings as well because the sensitivity can be improved even further, which I didn't notice on any other phone. Also, there are motion controls that you can map to the phone. For example, if you tilt left or right, you can ask it to reload the gun for you, which is damn cool, I feel. And another reason why gaming is awesome on the iQ11 is because it has a flat display. Flat display is better than curved display for gaming. Fight me in the comments. If you're a gamer, of course, iQ11 is an easy recommendation. Even if you aren't a gamer, this phone will blaze through daily tasks. Now talking about 5G performance, the iQ11 was fantastic with 5G on both Airtel and Geo networks. So both Airtel 5G and Geo 5G worked exceptionally well on the phone, absolutely no complaints whatsoever. And you also get a special standalone mode that you can switch on from the settings. Now I ran a Geo 5G test on the iQ11 and I got a download speed of 1.2 GBs per second, which is the maximum that I have achieved till date. 
Call quality over the earpiece is also really, really loud and clear and crisp. There's also a reason for that. I'll come to that in a bit. Also, like Geeky Ranjit has been pointing out recently in his videos that there are proximity sensor issues with a lot of phones, which is kind of true. Proximity sensor issue. When you're actually taking calls on your smartphones, uh, the calls will get muted or uh, some buttons will get clicked. And this is happening a lot because of the proximity sensor issues that I'm finding on many of the Android smartphones. So it's not there with the IQ 11, which is definitely a good thing. Now you must be wondering if the performance is so good, the network quality is so good, how's the battery life? Does it affect the battery life? In fact, the battery life is very good as well. So I ran two scenarios, one where I pushed the display resolution to 2K and set the refresh rate to 144 Hertz at all time. You shouldn't do it, but I did it just for the sake of, you know, science. So the screen on time that I got was about four hours, 20 minutes. Obviously it's gonna be low. I'm pushing it uh, so hard, but if you reduce the resolution to 1080p and if you, uh, you know, change the refresh rate to smart switch then you obviously get much better screen on time you can expect anywhere between 5 hours 30 minutes and 6 hours of screen on time easily and that's pretty good for a flagship phone with snapdragon 8 gen 2. now as for charging i tried three different runs with the 120 watt flash charge and every single time for 0 to 100 it took me 24 minutes to charge which is also very very good very fast i have no complaints now one feature that's missing on the iq 11 is wireless charging now that's something that is available only on the pro variant but that phone is i don't know if it's coming to India or not. It'd be great if it did, right? So the Ico 11's hero color is not this black variant that I've been holding till now, but the white one with BMW's stripes as well. If you don't want the BMW branding, I think this traditional black hue looks much better. In fact, I prefer the black one over the white one. But what makes the white one feel more premium is that it's got vegan leather. So the in-hand feel is much better. Now this one's got AG glass and it's got sort of this, you know, silky finish to it. So it's far more slippery compared to this. So you'll have to use this with the case. This one you can afford not to use with the case. Furthermore, this is a fairly big phone. It's about 8.4 millimeters thick and it also weighs above, you know, 205 grams. The one thing I like about Vivo and Aiku's industrial design is that they feel very premium and polished. First of all, you get metal sides and you also get a metal camera module. This is a step camera module with a metal plate and a glass plate on top of it, inside which is housed all the lens. But of course, like all phones go these days, table wobble. That happens. At the bottom, you get a Type-C port, a speaker grill, a mic, and a SIM card tray. SIM card tray, which accepts dual nano SIM cards. Of course, there is no expandable memory. Now, the problem with the Type-C port is that for a gaming phone, it only supports USB 2.0 speeds, which is a letdown. At the top, you get an infrared blaster. Ico is the only other brand apart from Xiaomi that provides infrared blasters, which is a good thing. And you also get, of course, a dual secondary mic. Now, about the speakers. This bottom speaker works in tandem with the earpiece for a stereo setup. This studio setup is one of the loudest, cleanest, dynamic and fullest sound that I have heard from a phone in a long time. Here's a comparison with a competitor phone and you will hear how good it sounds. Talking about sound, I also tried my high res DAC with my IEMs and of course, Aiku never disappoints on that front. That's not it, you can also go into settings and change a lot of sound options. You can also tune the sound for your specific ear profile as well, which is all very, very useful. So overall, the design is great, the build quality is absolutely fantastic, but there's one thing missing. And that one thing is an official IP rating, so don't take it to a pool or take it out in the rain or cover it with something protective. Now this phone has a massive 6.78 inch display with a center punch hole. Now this is a Super AMOLED panel with an upgraded 144Hz refresh rate and it's an LTPO4 panel. So what LTPO4 does to this display is that it can switch between any of the resolutions that are available between 1Hz and 144Hz dynamically depending on the scene or the visual that's playing on your phone. And that's not it. There's also a partial refresh rate option. One half can refresh at one rate and the other half can refresh at another rate. This is something that you cannot see in action, but what this helps with is in great battery life. This display also supports 1 billion colors. In pro mode, the color accuracy is really, really good. You of course get HDR10 plus support with support on Netflix as well. And the high brightness mode in auto brightness can go up to 1100 nits and the peak brightness in HDR can go up to 1800 nits. It looks really beautiful when you're actually watching HDR content 
content on YouTube and Netflix. This is a gaming phone as far as I'm concerned and the touch response rate is fantastic. You get a TSR of 300 and an instant touch sampling rate of 1200 as well. One thing that took me by surprise about the display this time around is that it's got glass protection and it's Corning Gorilla Glass Victus. Furthermore, you also get an in-display fingerprint scanner, which is extremely fast to unlock the phone. The haptic feedback is also tuned really well. It's a flagship level experience that you can expect from the haptic feedback on this phone. So for a flat display, this is one of the best displays that you can find out there. And if you end up buying the phone, you're gonna love using it. All right, finally talking about the cameras. The iQOO 11 has a triple camera setup on the rear with that V2 chip for enhanced image processing. So you get a primary Samsung GN5 sensor, which is a 50 megapixel sensor. You get an eight megapixel ultra wide and a 13 megapixel telephoto with 2x optical zoom and of course for the selfie camera you have a 16 megapixel sensor by the way telephoto camera is also a portrait camera we'll check that out in our test let's take a look at the camera samples so the primary camera captures good details in daylights although i feel that it could have been a tad crisper but what i particularly like is the fact that you now get a natural color mode and an enhanced color mode this is similar to the zeiss color mode on vivo's x series of phones albeit without the zeiss branding and in the natural color mode the color science is really really good but you know what even when the colors are boosted the colors are tastefully enhanced it doesn't look garish anywhere now the hdr performance has always been vivo and ico's strong suit so you can see how how much detail Vivo has pulled from the shadows in this specific sample. Plus, it always has the highlights under control, whether you're shooting in daylight or in tough indoor lighting scenarios. Just look at how well it manages to expose the bulbs with pinpoint accuracy. I love it. When shooting friends and family, the face tones are really, really good. Even against the light, you get such naturally exposed pictures. I wish there were slightly more details on offer though, like I mentioned in the daylight shots. Even in portraits, you get fantastic edge detection with a nice bokeh drop off too. Plus, you can also do night portraits as well with ease. And by default, the camera app chooses the 2x telephoto camera for portraits, but you can switch to 1x as well. Low light performance is pretty good too. Without night mode, the pictures do look soft, but with night mode, you can see the details from the shadows are lifted and you get far more sharpness as well. In basic scenarios, the night mode doesn't overdo the exposure and gives you some of the most natural details, which is good. In fact, the extreme night mode opens the shutter longer and you can get some of the most detailed shots in the dark. The 2X telephoto camera doesn't capture the most crisp shots, but it is good enough. What I particularly like about the 2X is that you can expect great color science consistency with the primary camera and you can even shoot it in the night. With night mode, the results are actually pretty usable. By the way, by default, you can zoom up to 20X, but in the super moon mode, I could lets you zoom up to 30x which lets you take enhanced moon shots like these looks pretty good I must say. The ultra wide is the softest of the three cameras because of the 8 megapixel resolution. Whether it is daylight or low light, you get soft shots. Good thing is there is great color science consistency with the primary camera and it can come in handy once in a while. But I know that I'm not going to use this ultra wide angle camera a lot. Also, there's no macro option on the iQOO 11. And the final camera in the stack, the selfie camera is just fantastic. I love the kind of facial tones that it captures, the details on offer and even the HDR performance. The low light selfies also look really good. And mind you, there is no night mode for for selfies. This is definitely one of the best selfie cameras I've used in a while. Now to close things off, you can shoot 8K videos but 4K 60fps is possible with standard stabilization. You get good colors, ample details, very good dynamic range and fantastic sound recording as well. This is a 4K 60fps video recording using the iQOO 11. I'm holding the phone and walking right now. But ultra stabilization at 1080p 60fps is even better for stabilization. By the way, you can also shoot good quality 4K 60fps videos using the telephoto. It is not very stable, but you can work with it. My only concern with video recording on the iQOO 11 is that you only get 1080p 30fps video recording using the ultra wide and selfie. The ultra wide 1080p 30fps video quality is decent with decent stabilization, but you can see noise around the darker portions. The 1080p 30fps selfie videos don't have EIS either, which is kind of disappointing. By the way, night video recording is fantastic on the iQOO. Plus, you can also shoot night motion sports mode shots, which if done right, can produce some nice results. Overall, except for that average ultra wide angle camera, the iQOO 11 is actually a competent shooter, one that I genuinely enjoyed using. All right, now we'll talk about the software. And iQOO has FunTouch OS 13 based on Android 13. Also, the company promises three years of software updates and four years of security updates. And it has been good at giving updates, so I'm really happy about that. FunTouch is, of course, one of the most heavily skinned Android themes out there. It has its stock Android elements like app permissions for notifications, theming engine, digital well-being, all of those things. But the core FunTouch OS software has its own design logic, which sort of doesn't work for me. The most annoying design change for me is that in the notification shade, the icon 
shapes are completely different and they look completely weird. Secondly, hot apps and hot games are consistently going to sit in your app drawer. There was no way to switch it off or I couldn't find one. There are many pre-installed third-party apps too. None of the ones that you won't use, of course, they can be uninstalled, but this is a flagship phone. They could have reduced the number at least. If you can look past these issues, you can actually live with Funtouch OS and iQOO has been really prompt with software updates as well, which is definitely a good thing. The iQOO 11 is priced at under Rs. 60,000 and it offers you more than what you could have asked for. What I like about the phone in particular is that it's not just a list of specs. It uses all of these specs to work cohesively and to give you a great smartphone experience. You know when I know that a phone is really, really good, when after the review period, I want to continue using it. And that is a feeling that I get with the iQOO 11. The major reason for that is because the cameras are well-tuned. And apart from that, you also get great multimedia experience thanks to the great display and the speakers. And the performance is great too. I play a lot of Apex Legends and we do a lot of sessions out here. And iQOO 11 is going to be my default gaming phone of choice now. Also, if you've noticed that this is a detailed review of only the iQOO 11 and I don't have any competing, uh, you know, phone for comparison out here, primarily because there is so much to talk about the iQOO 11. Otherwise, this would have been an even longer video, which is already long. Also, because its main competitors like the Xiaomi 13, 13 Pro and of course, the OnePlus 11 haven't launched in India yet. So when that happens, we'll get more comparisons out. So what do you guys think of the iQOO 11? Let me know in the comment section below. For more such awesome videos, subscribe to Track and Tech English. I'll see you guys in the next one. Keep tracking and stay safe.